thank you very much for that uh, lecture. And I'd like to now introduce uh, uh, the first of our two outstanding discussants, uh, uh, Professor Mark Hancock from the University of California at Los Angeles. He's currently the chair of the Department of Statistics at UCLA. Professor Hancock received his PhD in statistics from the University of Chicago. His research is largely, largely motivated by questions in, in, in social sciences, where he has worked extensively in areas of, of social network data, special processes, and longitudinal data in, in labor, uh, <coughs> labor economics. The focus of several of his recent papers has been in designing and utilizing respondent driven samples. He has, he has authored numerous peer reviewed uh, publications in, in top statistical and subject area journals, and he has co authored three books. Uh, Professor Hancock is a fellow of the American Statistical Association, and it is my honor to present to you, to you Professor Marshall. Joined by an, uh, 
uh, informal social net, net network. So in addition to the outcome variables we do have, we also have this social network of re relations, auxiliary in information we hope to, to, to exploit. And the last thing we have are other things. We must have access to at least some members of the population of, of interest here. So how does the adaptive sampling design work? Well, we begin with a reasonable, maybe con convenient sample, but some sort of sample of people who actually start in the population of, of interest. And then we expand that sample, this is a core idea, by the researchers sampling those tied to those that we already have in our sample. So we move from the in, in, individuals who have sampled to other individuals within the sampling frame using this approach. Now, this is a, obviously a very good way to uh, collect the sample size, but there's a number of different concerns or issues we've got to take into account when we think about using this. Uh, one is the so-called seeds. I refer to the seeds, the, the initial set in Steve's words. Uh, how dependent is the final sample upon the original seeds? And in particular, in cases where this is not a probability sample, the seeds, for various reasons, are not chosen as a probability sample, we'll need to take into account their dependence on that uh, process as, as, as well. And one other issue that comes up and I think is very important in this area is confidentiality and privacy issues. Uh, as we go through, the research is sampling those tied uh, to those already in the, in, the, in the sample. So if we have a hard to reach or potentially stigmatized group, we need to be very careful about confidentiality issues in terms of uh, tracking those uh, folks down. So I'll, I'll be coming back to this issue in a, uh, a little more depth later on. And the last, which is uh, an issue when statisticians are close to our heart, okay, how are we going to actually do inference based on, on, on this? In particular, in most cases it's applied, we know the social network exists, but we only partially observe the social net network at the same time to partially observe the outcome variables. So dealing with that unknown social network, which is at the heart of our sampling de 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 design, is going to be a fairly substantial challenge. All right, so uh, what are the strengths uh, that Steve went through in uh, adaptive sampling method? Well, one is that it uh, exploits the auxiliary information in the social network, uh, which you only found on the standard D design, and that network structure, the structure of those relationships, is a very useful way to improve the design. And in, because of this, as he showed, it dramatically increases the range of possible designs we have over the uh, uh, standard ones we started. Use it. And uh, because it's a data, it, as it works through the sampling process, we can find through the sampling process features of the pop, pop, population and exploit those to, close, to improve the efficiency of the sampling design as well. So there's a data of nature using in, information for the design as we move through and, and collect data, I think is a very, very positive thing. And all of this leads to increased efficiency of sampling, which is ultimately the, the primary driver, where a conventional design uh, would be very, very uh, inefficient because uh, of, uh, if you say, for example, the pop population is very, uh, the, the outcome variables are very rare, you can definitely have dramatic improvement of uh, efficiency. So these are the uh, aspects that Steve went and through. So I'd like to bring, bring, bring up as a uh, role of the discussion some issues that are important to address in, in, in this case. In the examples that Steve was describing, we typically want the seeds of the initial sample to be something like 50% or more of the total final sample. And the arguments for this are, are, are good, that if the, we initially have a, a fairly broad breach of, of the seeds, we're going to get pretty good coverage of the uh, sampling frame or pop, pop, population of interest, that's going to give us low bias, so to speak. And then we add on top of that the second half of it being this adaptive sampling design, which as Steve showed, is going to uh, increase the amount of information collected per sample and hence reduce the, vary, uh, reduce the variance. So my view is that uh, the adaptive network approach is more like a turbocharger to a conventional design. Half of it we can do by conventional means of the original uh, sample and then go through and essentially gain a lot more in top information because of the adaptive com components of it. So that's worth noting. Now the other two issues I want to address more is that the choice of the seeds by our known sampling design can be difficult. If we do it say by spatial sampling or some other pro uh, pr process, 
that can work fairly well. And in a lot of circumstances where we might consider adaptive design, the choice of seeds, it's quite difficult to do with a conventional design. And the other one is link tracing itself can be challenging in terms of privacy in many populations that's a concern, and just the logistics it's, it's, it's itself. So just to think of the example that Steve gave in, in his talk, Col uh, Colorado Springs, 50% uh, of the seeds were chosen randomly in his sim sim simulation studies, and the other 50% were found by eliciting drug, uh, using re relationships amongst people sampled and then tracking down uh, the, the alters, those uh, who, who uh, have had drug using relationships with uh, sample members. And so this last one, tracking down, could be very, very challenging. Firstly, because they might, might not give us uh, direct, unambiguous inf information about who the alters were, the people they're tied, tied, tied with. But then we also actually have to physically lo locate them. So in many hard and hard to reach uh, populations, these lo lo logistics can be very, very challenging compared to our standard approaches. Um, okay. Now, one thing I'd like to do is to bring it back for those who are more familiar with design-based methods is to create a table about various uh, adaptive uh, sampling schemes and just see where they fit in the, in the usual way. Now, in the usual way, what we want to do is uh, compute the inclusion probability, so the marginal probability of each individual in the pop population is included in the sample. Now, uh, we can do that for one, one way where we grab C, because that's why probability design but if you think about K, K waves, so taking out from the initial set, sampling once, that would be wave one, sampling twice, wave two. If you think about in, uh, uh, sampling working through the process, we actually can't compute the first order inclusion probabilities directly from that process because they depend upon aspects of the network we don't observe through our sample. So unless the underlying social network is observed completely beforehand, which is almost never the, the case, we can't actually compute the first order inclusion probabilities. And for many other designs, that's also true. And if you're looking about link or di dyadic measures, second order inclusion probabilities to some, to some degree, they're also very hard to, to compute. So the core idea here is that for most realistic de designs, doing our standard approach, which is directly computing the inclusion probabilities, isn't going to work. So what Steve does is very clever, and he showed in his talk, is he finesses this, this idea in a very clever way by using traditional sampling pro probabilities in a brow 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 black colorization approach to compute S without having to compute directly these inclusion probabilities. So I thought that's a very strong uh, contribution, very useful there. Um, so this, the next thing I'm going to talk about is different perspectives and where models fit, fit in or, or, or not. And just to get a bit explicit about what I'm talking about, we have a, a finite po population network specific effect. So inference is actually for the, uh, the direct po population we're focusing on. Now, the second would be we uh, impose uh, a super pop pop population process, thinking about the network or the population of interest to be a realization of a stochastic process, but still with finite pop pop population inference. And the last, of course, which is very common, is just think about uh, the network itself, again, in a super pop pop population stochastic modeling sense, and actually want to do inference for the uh, structure of the social network it's, it's itself. But mainly we're in this second lot layer here, we can uh, do a lot within this frame, as, as Steve uh, shows. Um, so one thing I'll say about this is the modeling of social networks is uh, clearly very, very com complex. I could say a lot about this, but because they're just highly uh, structured stochastic systems, writing down these models is going to be, in general, very challenging. So just a, as a classic image we've all seen before, but I think is very helpful here, we could have a super pop, pop population model and think about the kind of population we're interested in as in some sense an IID draws the super pop population process. And then we have a very, potentially very complex sampling design here, drawing from the super pop, pop population. This would be the, an adaptive network design in this process. So one way of setting up the super pop population process is a simple drawing here and then a very complex drawing here. And within this frame, we can still use this super pop population superstructure in a literal sense to help us do inference, finite pop population inference. And so a lot of the things I'll just show uh, in the next few slides will be 
are directly related to this idea. Okay, uh, so just, this is probably a little too much to be uh, just to say here. This is the issue of if you want to use a super population approach, one thing we'd really like to do is be able to do inference for the underlying super population model. So if Z are the uh, covariance and the link variables which Steve presented here in his notation, then we can think about those as the observed component of those and the unobserved. And then just using a classical formal decomposition, we can write down the joint likelihood for what we've observed here, plus the design component D here, the aspects which we observe. Then we can uh, rep represent that in this formal sense as just a product of two, two terms. One is just the sampling design, given the finite network we actually have, multiplied by an underlying super pop population model here for the generation of the structure to just represent some parameter eta. So just as Steve wrote, we can write down this in a formal way representing these, these two. And then just to be, again, formal but, but helpful, we can now have a, a formal de definition of what adaptive means. We can define with this notation as, uh, we can define an uh, adaptive mapping design as one in which the design mechanism itself, given the observed network structure covariance and links, is just, uh, can be written as a function of only the observed component of that net net network, and in general, just for all possible realizations here. And so the idea here is we can write this down that the design depends uh, only upon the observed components and not upon the unobserved component of the net, net network. This, of course, is uh, essentially the idea of missing a random as Steve uh, mentioned, developed by uh, Groove and Little and, and, and others. This is a very core idea and extremely useful in understanding what's going on. Now, I would actually say one thing that's very interesting about this is the complexity of Z, Z here, though it's essentially the same idea, puts a different light on this fundamental re 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 relationship here. This was put out uh, by Steve and over Frank earlier on, and basically they, they, they show that the standard network sampling the, the designs, link, link, link tracing designs are adaptive in this sense. And what that means is we can uh, use uh, the classic approach now uh, to, in essence, show that the overall likelihood can be broken up into a sampling design likelihood and a face value likelihood. And again, these are formal rep rep representations we've seen before, but I think are helpful in this con con context. In particular, the, the face value likelihood we can do inference for the model parameter uh, just based on the observed uh, data component here by summing over a complete data model. So this gives us a very tractable approach to do partial observation for network, inference for the model. Once we have inference for the uh, model, we can uh, go ahead and um, uh, do inference for the underlying product of the population. So I'll give just an example of how this approach is used in a model a assisted way. So this is to stay within the design-based frame, but still try to use the model and super population approach to, 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 to help us. So the core idea is we want to estimate the, say, first order inclusion prob probability for the actual finite network we have, and though we only partially observe this component here. So the core trick that uh, uh, Krista and myself used in this process was to say, well, for a given network, we can compute this uh, inclusion property, like we know the network, because we can simulate the sampling design over the net network on a computer and just compute, compute these in a very natural, empirical way. Now, of course, uh, that's assuming we know the actual network, which, which we don't. So to get around that, instead of assuming we know the inclusion problems, we approximate them by the following simple formula here. Just take the expectation of the average over the unobserved components of the net, net network of this formula here. So this for given ZZ to compute. And this is a, uh, we can actually est est estimate the moral parameter eta here and just go do it directly uh, uh, and compute these processes here, and hence get the estimates of the pi pi i, and use those for classic design-based inference. And of course, we can do the same thing with the second-order inclusion problems and then compute variances. So there's no theory about how to actually do that based on exponential family models, but I won't go through those, and then how to do that process, but I'll just obviously leave, leave, leave those here. Now the compute stand there is the simplest thing we do is just use a parametric bootstrap because we put all the structure in place to make that possible. I won't go through that process, but that has appeared in a, a paper in, uh, recently to go through that process. But that's a network-assisted approach uh, in a design-based frame. 
Last thing I'll just briefly mention, which I think is useful here, is how to get uh, direct hidden populations. And uh, a method which has been used a lot, which I think is very prob pro problematic, but very interesting in the double sense of that term, uh, is this kind of driven sampling here. Because it deals with the issues we're brought up with, but in principle deals with the issues that we brought up with, with uh, other forms of adaptive sampling. So what are the key aspects of it? And the sampling that design is the same idea, except we require the respondent to choose amongst this social circle rather than the researcher chooses. Uh, and so that's a key, key difference. Same idea that the uh, respondent chooses. And the idea with the seed dependence is if we start off with, say, a convenient sample of seeds, what we actually do is start off with a few of those rather than fifty percent a small number, but then follow through a large number of ways, or large number in a survey sense, 10 to 15 different ways of working through with the idea of moving away from, from those actual seeds. So a huge plus of this is that we, the sense of respondent driven, they're driving uh, the actual process of selecting uh, others, means that this, we don't need to uh, identify and deal with the uh, uh, fundamental privacy issues. So of course, we then have to do, this is good, we have to do estimation from, from this, which is very challenging. And just to say a little explicit about the strengths and weaknesses of this approach, well, big strength is great, uh, uh, effective at collecting data in a literal sense, because you can use the process of moving uh, through it there, uh, the data and the process as well. It's not driven by you, driven by the re respondents. If we use in circumstances where a sampling frame doesn't exist, this is a huge plus because you're using, again, the social network to move out amongst the top population of interest, uh, doesn't require initial probability sample, and in fact it's incredibly widely used uh, around the world, especially for uh, estimates of uh, in the population of high risk of HIV. Now the clear downside of it is that it's unclear which it can be considered a probability sample, uh, mainly because it's, it is respondent driven. Great way to collect data, it makes it very, very challenging to do inference. So I won't really talk about uh, how to do that in this uh, discussion, but it's a very, uh, it's a very interesting old term. Uh, so just, I'll just finish you with some uh, the topic which I won't cover, but just point out which the audience might want to raise questions about how uh, to work through the process. One is that social networks are uh, com complex. So in the models that I've pre presented and a lot of the um, uh, temporal dynamic networks that Steve pre presented, the model specification is going to, of the social ne network models is going to drive a lot of what you actually see in the di dynamics and effect of intervention. And so working on those is quite difficult. Now, of course, we only have partial in information about our social networks, our social temporal net networks as well. And there's been a number of different approaches to, to this, uh, in addition to the ones that Steve, Steve mentioned. Another thing I think is important is to think of alternative designs to improving the overall designs. Because a lot of the improvements will come from the design phase of it, I think, rather than the analysis phase of it. And there's various ways of doing privatised network sampling, which I won't go into, but the core idea is to improve the information content of the survey overall. And just the last comment I'll make, which my other dis discussions might bring up, is that uh, the value, I think, of empirical likelihood in this area. What I think empirical likelihood does is gives us a way of bridging design-based and model-based inference with, uh, with any like having the most the very positive attributes of both. Now, I won't go into it technically here, but I think it has very high value in these areas, and hopefully that will come up in the discussion. So thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, the comments you'll have when we're done.